councils were generally convened and conducted under the heavy hand of the emperors and empresses of the Byzantine Empire. The imperial interests in the proceedings were often as much political as theological. The councils debated points of doctrine that may seem unimportant today. Yet, as the 20th century English writer G. K. Chesterton has pointed out, these details made a considerable difference to the overall shape of Christian belief. This is so inexplicable to all the modern critics of the history of Christianity. I mean the monstrous wars about small points of theology, the earthquakes of emotion about a gesture or a word. It was only a matter of an inch, but an inch is everything. Remember that the church went in specifically for dangerous ideas. The idea of birth through a Holy Spirit, of the death of a divine being, of the forgiveness of sins, or the fulfillment of prophecies, are ideas which anyone can see need but a touch to turn them into something blasphemous or ferocious. The third ecumenical council was held at Ephesus in 431. The Persian prelate Nestorius had been preaching that though God and Jesus were joined in perfect unity of action, Jesus was not God. This council at Ephesus affirmed that whatever Christians say about Jesus also can be said in some sense of God. The council at Ephesus also affirmed that Mary, the mother of Jesus, may legitimately be given the title of Theotokos, the mother of God. In 451, the fourth great council, the Council of Chalcedon, affirmed that Jesus Christ is truly God and truly man, consisting also of a reasonable soul and body, of one substance with the Father as regards his Godhead, and at the same time of one substance with us as regards his manhood, like us in all respects apart from sin. As regards his Godhead, begotten of the Father before the ages, but yet as regards his manhood, begotten for us men and for our salvation of Mary the Virgin, the God-bearer. One and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, recognized in two natures, without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. After Chalcedon came the fifth of the seven ecumenical councils. This one was held in 553, again in Constantinople, and is called the Second Council of Constantinople. This council condemned the teachings of the third century theologian Origen, who taught that all spiritual beings including human sinners in hell and even Satan himself, can eventually be saved. Today many historians question whether Origen's teachings were fully understood by those who condemned him. Another council of Constantinople in 680 condemned monothelitism, the view that Jesus Christ had no human will and thus was not fully human. Finally, in 787, Another council of Nicaea, this time under the leadership of the Empress Irene, affirmed that icons can legitimately be used in worship. This action automatically condemned the position of the iconoclasts, who said that to venerate icons is a form of idolatry. This last of the seven great councils thus ratified an orthodox practice that was to produce an artistic legacy of beautifully stylized iconography. An equally impressive but very different artistic tradition in the Roman Catholic Church would produce sculpture and paintings whose realism would influence art history in the Renaissance and beyond. The significance of the seven ecumenical councils has been recognized only with a good deal of hindsight. During the centuries in which they met, other councils were also meeting, but they issued decrees that now are rejected by both Catholic and Orthodox Christians. The decrees of these seven councils eventually came to be acknowledged by most, although not all, Christians. They have become definitive statements of Christian faith. 
So the fundamentals of Christian belief, including the Nicene interpretation of God's incarnation in Jesus Christ, were in place by the end of the 8th century. In the year 285, a young man named Antony decided to try to live out Jesus' commands in a more radical way. He sold all that he had and went to live as an ascetic in the desert of Lower Egypt, reportedly living there to the age of 110. He became known as Abba Antony, meaning Father Antony. The name Abba at that time did not mean that he was a priest, but that he was a wise Christian man who could guide others. Abba Antony's purified life attracted disciples and imitators, and by the 4th century, many Christian men and women were living as hermits or in small ascetic communities in the deserts of Syria and Egypt. The name Amma was used to refer to a respected woman ascetic, and all women ascetics lived in separate communities until much later. The exodus of Christians into the desert actually began before Constantine's conversion. However, Constantine's tendency to intermingle the affairs of church and state almost certainly caused serious Christians to fear that the church had ceased to be an alternative to worldliness. Now it seemed that Christianity itself had become worldly. As a result, the 4th century saw both the emergence of Christendom and the first great movement of Christians out of the world. At first, Christian ascetic communities were small and informal. The inevitable tendency for groups to form routines then led to organized communities that began what we now know as the monastic life. In Western Europe, monastic religious communities gradually came to be organized under specific rules for life that had been established by the group's founder. The best known of the early Western religious orders is undoubtedly the one founded by St. Benedict, a 6th century monk from Nursia in northern Italy. In the introduction to his rule, that is a list of principles defining the Benedictine way of life, he outlines the outlook and purpose of a monastic community. I am to erect a school for beginners in the service of the Lord which I hope to establish on laws not too difficult or grievous, but if, for reasonable cause, for the retrenchment of vice or preservation of charity, I require some things which may seem too austere, you are not thereupon to be frightened from the ways of salvation. Those ways are always straight and narrow at the beginning, but as we advance in the practices of religion and in faith, the heart insensibly opens and enlarges through the wonderful sweetness of his love, and we run in the way of God's commandments. If then we keep close to our school and the doctrine we learn in it, and persevere in the monastery till death, we shall here share by patience in the passion of Christ, and hereafter deserve to be united with him in his kingdom. Amen. It would be impossible to overestimate the importance of monastic life for the churches of both East and West. Eastern Orthodox monks, with their piety, their learning, and their devotion to a radical Christian way of life, quickly became a kind of intellectual and spiritual elite within the Orthodox churches. Both theologians and church leaders sprang from their ranks. Today, Eastern Orthodox bishops are always taken from the ranks of monks. Monastic communities were in some ways even more significant in the Roman Catholic Church. The Western Roman Empire continued to disintegrate during the early Middle Ages, and monasteries were often the only organized form of religion within a whole region. Indeed, Roman Catholic monasteries were sometimes the only stable organized community at all. They played a vital role not only as a center for religious life, but as a center for social and economic stability and they were virtually the only Western institutions that preserved the literary and philosophical heritage of the pre-Christian Roman Empire. Finally, the monasteries were important because they offered medieval women an alternative to marriage. Here women could live independently from fathers, brothers and husbands, pursuing a life of holiness, prayer and learning. 
As monasticism developed, it came to...